Prior to 1937, the part of the shadow had been played briefly by James Lacurto and for five years by Frank Reddick. Old radio buffs will forever associate Reddick's voice with one role that has survived the ravages of time, the part of reporter Carl Phillips in the famous 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast by Orson Welles. In 1937, Welles' star was in its ascendancy. Though he was only in his early twenties, Wells had already attracted a large following and was well known in New York theater circles. But Wells craved a national audience, something he believed he could acquire through radio. Announcer, Ken Roberts. To play the part of uh, Lamont Cranston, the uh, whole of radio was scoured, I suppose you might say, to find an actor who would be perfect in the part. And, of course, they found the actor who was perfect in the part because they went to Orson Welles, who by that time had quite a reputation and had also achieved great fame on Broadway already because he had become perhaps the youngest, most successful producer in the history of Broadway. So here was a young man whose name was on everybody's lips, and Blue Cole was smart enough to approach him with the idea of playing Lamont Cranston in this new version of The Shadow. Orson was very, very busy at that time, and it seemed almost impossible for him to take on such an assignment, but uh, great concessions were made so that he would be able to take it on. Among the concessions, well, perhaps the biggest, of course, was that he would not have to attend rehearsal, that uh, the program would be prepared and almost completed, except for his appearance, and when the moment came that they would be ready for him, they were prepared to send for him at the theater where he would be rehearsing his own company, the Mercury Theater, and he would come down in a chauffeur-driven limousine or a taxi cab to the studio where we were working. We were at the RCA studio on 24th Street between uh, 3rd Avenue and Lexington Avenue in New York, and Orson was working at the Princess Theater with the, his Mercury Group. The Princess Theater was on 39th Street and Broadway. So it wasn't too big a jump for Orson, but he was able to make it. He would hop into his taxi cab or limo, as I said, appear at our studio in about five minutes, walk in, pick up a script, go to the microphone, and start to perform the show. The show was recorded, of course, and that's why we were able to do it in that fashion. Bill Sweets was no longer doing the program in this form. It was now being directed by Clark Andrews. And there was one lovely moment when Orson walked into the studio after being summoned, and we were all ready to go to work. He picked up his script, went to the microphone, and suddenly the script fell out of his hands and spread all over the studio floor. Well, there was consternation in the control room. There was fear on the faces of the musicians. Everybody was terribly upset. Suddenly, Orson merely smiled, reached into his pocket, and took out another script. The whole thing had been planned to frighten the director. Organist Rosa Rio remembers Orson Welles. Orson Welles was entirely different uh, from the <laughs> character he is today. He was young, very thin, very good looking, and minus ego, minus weight and ego. He was really a lot of fun. I, 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 he was fun in those days and very generous, but he was a real clown. He was an actor every, every inch of, uh, of being an actor, every minute of being an actor. For instance, when we would have the break, you know, maybe a five or ten minutes break out on the hour, why, in essence, Everybody else would be uh, resting, not he. He would out, be out clowning. Whatever was the picture of that day, that was what he was putting on an act. And I remember the first time, a Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs had just opened at Radio City. And he got a broom, he did the witch, he did every part, and he had us just howling. Really, in a way, it was nice because everybody was so relaxed from laughing at him because he could really put on each character. And then you'd go right back into the script. He were very relaxed and really did a really good job. It, it just broke the tension. But I would say he was a riot, and at that at the time, he put on a play on Broadway, too, you know. He was a very generous guy. Uh, uh, he, he gave several of us tickets to, to go to the show. And uh, he, he was really very, very lovely, while Agnes Moorhead was very aloof. She was very, very aloof. And uh, the cast, as a rule, were very wonderful. Writer and actor Sidney Sloan. 
as everybody knows, Orson never rehearsed the show. He had a standby man who would appear at the time of the rehearsal, and uh, they would mark the script and read the lines just for timing. And uh, when uh, Wells would walk in at the opening, uh, just about the time we were, uh, the show was on the air, and he'd walk in and he'd hand him the script and he'd go into who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men in that business. And uh, he would go through it. Well, he got to the middle break this one time, and then they took it away for the commercial in another studio. And he said, hey, this is a hell of a script. How does it end? <laughs> Here he's playing the show. Walter Gibson. It meant nothing to Orson, that first series. Uh, what happened was the Mercury Theater wanted, uh, they all wanted jobs on Sunday because they were not playing on Sunday and they all decided to get in radio and they decided if they could take over a radio show it would be great and the only show that happened to come up that was open was The Shadow so they took it and they had it for two seasons Ken Roberts I think I should tell you about some of the actors who appeared on The Shadow in those years there were such wonderful names as Everett Sloan Frank Reddick, whom I mentioned before, who went on from being the narrator on the original show to being one of Austin's company. There was Paul Stewart, there was Martin Gable, Arlene Francis, Alice Frost, who had been playing the lead in Big Sister, another successful radio serial, and many, many others. Finally, Austin was ready to go on to bigger things. He was ready to go on from the theater to Hollywood for the production of Citizen Kane. And so we no longer would have Orson, and we were sure the show would go off the air, as I just mentioned, but wonder of wonders, it did not. The program was strong enough to continue with other people in the role of Lamont Cranston. One of the first of them was Bill Johnstone. Johnstone had played supporting roles on The Shadow under Wells, and in the fall of 1938 won the part of Lamont Cranston over the almost 80 other actors who auditioned for it. Johnstone played the role of the Shadow for five seasons. Agnes Moorhead continued as Margot Lane until 1940. Here is a brief excerpt from Can the Dead Talk, the program that concluded the Shadow's fifth season on March 19, 1939. It was vitally necessary that Lamont Cranston should be thought dead, so that Voltan would keep his knowledge of the Shadow's identity to himself until I had time to figure a way out. But Lamont, why didn't you tell me and spare me the suffering? I wouldn't have given you away. I didn't uh, take the chance. Voltan might have read your thoughts. A sinister man, Margot, with some rather extraordinary mental capabilities. Would it surprise you to know that he had perfected plans for a world revolt? He had. You mean he's... Yes. Voltan is dead. As the ghost of the shadow, I faced him tonight in a haunted house. When he thought his mental powers were going back on him, he shot his servant, who very conveniently strangled Voltan before he died, too. Oh, terrible. Oh, I don't think so, Margot. There's quite enough unrest among nations today without the machinations of an insane mental genius. Yes, I think the world will be a great deal better off without Mr. Voltan. It's a pity that others with a like capacity for stirring up trouble can't meet the same fate. But now, friends, we have a real treat in store for you. I want you to meet two grand actors. Our stars, Margot Lane, who in reality is the charming Agnes Moorhead, and Lamont Cranston, who is known in real life as Bill Johnstone. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Well, Margot, <laughs> I should say Agnes, I know you'll agree with me that it's been a great privilege for you and me to have played the roles of Margot Lane and The Shadow for the past six months. Yes, it has, Bill, and it's been a lot of fun besides... I can't begin to tell you how much I've appreciated being with The Shadow during his exciting adventures. And I know that we appreciate the generous cooperation we've received from our sponsors, the Blue Coal Dealers, in teaching young and old alike 
that crime doesn't pay. If we succeeded in driving home that moral, then we'll have accomplished our purpose. As Ken Roberts has told you, ladies and gentlemen, this is our final broadcast of the winter season, but we sincerely hope to be back with another series in the fall. Whether or not the shadow program returns is up to you, our listeners. In the theater, you know, we actors can tell by the applause if the audience enjoys our efforts to entertain them, but in radio, the only way to know whether or not the audience enjoys the entertainment is by their purchases of the product that makes the program possible or by their personal approval to the sponsors. So, friends, if you've liked this Shadow series and want to hear the show again next fall, won't you phone or write your nearest blue coal dealer and let him know? Your purchases of blue coal and your phone calls to the blue coal dealers will indicate to them whether or not they should bring you the Shadow program again in September. And now, on behalf of our entire cast, hearty thanks to you again for your loyalty to our show and your support of Blue Coal. Goodbye, Bill and Agnes, and we hope you'll be back again in the fall. And friends, remember that you can continue to thrill to the adventures of the shadow during the summer months by getting the Shadow magazine at your local newsstand. This is Ken Roberts saying goodbye for Blue Coal. In 1943, Johnstone left the part of the shadow to seek his acting fortune in Hollywood. Brett Morrison, a popular Chicago radio actor, new to New York, landed the role of Lamont Cranston. Theater Time, Broadway. Once again, you're invited to attend the opening night performance of a new play in the little theater off Times Square. All theater land thrills to those magic words, opening night. It's a supreme moment for the producer. It's the acid test for the author and the actors. They're all wagering their time and talent on their ability to please the public taste for entertainment. Will they succeed tonight? I was doing Mr. First Nighter, which was also a mutual show out of Chicago. It used to come on right after The Shadow. The Shadow came on, and then First Nighter came on out of Chicago. So I always used to hear the tail end of The Shadow, the closing signature, the weed of crime bears bitter fruit, crime does not pay, while we're getting our last-minute corrections and waiting to go on the air. But then the uh, war, of course, broke out, and of course everything came to a dead stop as far as radio and all was concerned. And I went into special service. When I got out of the army, I came on to New York because I was stationed in Boston for service command. I got a call. I was doing a show called The Falcon, which was about the first mm -hmm. show I got here in New York, just playing character on it. It wasn't the title role. And I got a call for an audition. I didn't know what it was for. It was Ruth Rolf and Ryan. It was the advertising agency, and they just called me for an audition, and I was supposed to be there, I don't know, say, 1 o'clock or something like that. Not later than 1 o'clock. They were losing the studio at 1 o'clock. And I was on the air at the Falcon, or I'm not sure about the time of the audition, but anyway, right up practically to the last minute. So by the time I got there, it was about four minutes to the hour when they were going to lose the... Uh, the studio so I, I ran in and they just said well there isn't time to do anything just read this it's an opening and closing signatures and just read it and it was the opening and closing signature of the shadow and I just read it the way I always remembered it yes. and left and that was that and I thought well you know forget it <laughs> and a couple days later I got a call saying you're it in 1966, Morrison and Grace Matthews, who played Margot Lane from 1946 to 1949, met to reminisce about their long associations with the Shadow program. Orson Welles was the first one to do the Shadow when he became an integral part of the story itself. Before that, there were two or three when the Shadow was merely um, sort of a host was like Raymond of Inner Sanctum. He never appeared in the story, the body of the story, but he was merely the host who presented the thing. They set up the framework, and then they had a, some sort of a cops and robbers well, thing. Now, wasn't Bill Johnstone one of those? Bill Johnstone preceded me. Orson Welles, oh, Orson Welles was before Bill Johnstone. I see. And before him, uh, I think uh, Mr. Reddick was one of the original shadows before he became part of the story. Brett Morrison was the shadow more than any other actor that played the part. 
From all accounts, Orson Welles allocated precisely one hour of his time per week to the role. Half of that hour was spent in transit to and from the studio. The role was calculated to serve as a stepping stone to greater things, to bring Welles to the attention of the general public. William Johnstone, a competent radio actor who followed Welles, did not involve himself to any great degree in the Cranston role, but Brett Morrison took the role seriously. He carried himself like the star of the program, demonstrating the caring, the concern a true star often feels for the success of his enterprise. The people looked the way you wanted them to look. The places looked the way you imagined yes. them. And now with television, it's a fait accompli. I mean, you accept mm -hmm. it, and if you don't like it, you turn it off and go to something else. But that was the beauty of radio. It, it helped to stimulate the imagination. And in comparison, now they sound very corny when you listen to some of these old shows. Because we've made such tremendous strides uh, technically and uh, also performance-wise. In radio, everything had to be spelled out in large capital letters so that, you know, I've got you covered with this <laughs> gun, you know, so that it was clear to the audience what was happening, which today makes it seem kind of corny. But that was the beauty of radio, and that's the thing that I think is, is missing in our entertainment today. Shadow expert Anthony Tolan. Rick Morrison was a real renaissance man. He was a singer, a writer, he wrote a couple episodes of The Shadow, a composer, a director. After radio, he was a dubbing director on foreign films where he would produce the English soundtracks for years. He was a master at it. Uh, he was an interior decorator. He designed uh, Mercedes McCambridge's apartment. He was an all-around performer, writer, singer, composer, musician, very fine pianist. And he really was Lamont Cranston to a large degree. And he had the elegance of Bill Johnstone, for example, as Lamont Cranston. But he also had the power of Orson Welles. For several years in the mid-40s, the Shadow Program originated before a live theater audience. Brett Morrison, typically, went the extra mile. In scenes where Cranston became the shadow, and solely for the benefit of the theater audience, as the radio audience could not see him, Morrison would don his own cape and slouch hat to match the appearance of the shadow as he was depicted in the shadow magazine. In preparing this program, we talked with more than a dozen of Morrison's contemporaries on the shadow. Not one had anything but praise for this fine actor. This is quite amazing, but you'd be surprised how many adults actually thought that Lamont Cranston was a true character who had the power to make himself invisible. Because toward the end of the program, or somewhere around, I think, when we were in Korea, uh, we would receive letters, I'd receive letters from people saying, we think it's a crime that you're keeping the shadow here when he could be spying for our country, you know, again. Really? Oh, yes. Yes, it's really fantastic. Isn't, I had no idea that, that, amazing? that uh, I've, I've seen this happen, uh, identity happen in uh, daytime radio, you know, with yes, characters. They, yes. They think they actually exist. Yes. And it's, uh, I don't know how they they uh, correlate the time element that, that at a certain time they're <laughs> able to eavesdrop on their lives. Recently, Grace Matthews recalled how she felt auditioning for the part of Margot Lane in 1946. I was so frozen with fear that um, I don't remember, I mean, I just blanked out. Uh, it was a very popular show, and it was a great plum to get, you know. And so I thought, oh, no, I, you know, and so I just went in. I, I didn't think I had a chance. I mean, all the people in New York who, you know, worked so much in New York, and they all knew each other, and I was an outsider, and they'd look at me, and, you know, who's she anyway? So I was scared to death. He was such a nice director, though, and he was, he, he was a, you know, one of those rare, beautiful people that tries so much to put you at ease. It was impossible to put me at ease, but, but he did try. It was um, midsummer, 
when I auditioned. And of course, the sh I don't think the sh I think the show was off, and we didn't go on starting until September. But then we were doing it in the in the Long Acre Theater, and that's when I first met Brett Morrison, and be he became such a dear friend, just most marvelous man. Approximately 900 shadow programs were produced. 200 of these with the shadow as host prior to his becoming the central character. Of the 700 programs that featured Lamont Cranston, about 200 are known to have survived, and of these, around 100 are available commercially on disc. The 200 programs in circulation, either commercially or traded among collectors, are fairly evenly divided between performances by Johnstone and Morrison, with Wells, who did fewer programs to begin with, in third place. But the actress heard most often today in the role of Margot Lane is the lovely and very gracious Grace Matthews. From the time I took over the part, it, it was an audience program, and it was at the Long Acre Theater, off just uh, 44th Street, Broadway. And we would have, during the week, we would have in a studio just a read-through, mostly for timing and any changes, you know, that had to be made. Then we would gather at one o'clock on Sundays and start rehearsing. Um, the show went on the air at five o'clock. The audience would come in about 4.30. Um, it, it was just really a great experience, and, and the audiences, I mean, the house was jammed every, every, every Sunday, you know, it was marvelous, and this went on for a long time. And then I discovered that um, I was going to have a child, and so I went to the director and said, look, I'm sorry if you, uh, if you have to fire me, up, but uh, I mean, that, that's the situation. He said, Grace, relax. Now, look, we can... Um, We'll go on doing it in the theater as long as as possible, and then we will just move into a studio for a few weeks. So we moved to W O R Studios and 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 did it there until that little episode was over, and then we came back to the theater. So that's how all that. Um, but you know, Brett was um, simply marvelous. It was a long rehearsal day, and. Um, Everybody, we, at the beginning, we used to have a lunch break, and, and in the Broadway area, it was a little difficult on a Sunday to find something to eat. So he used to arrive with his houseman with a big picnic basket with food for everybody, and it was it was lovely, delicate food, scrumptious food, and so we'd all just sit around and relax and enjoy it. He, I, I, this man was. A saint, really. Just dear, and so talented. So that's how we got out of the theater and then back into the theater. <laughs> oh, it was great fun. It was, it, was, it was one of the highlights of the week, as far as I was concerned, because they had some of the best actors, and it was, was so beautifully cast. You know, they'd come on for one show. I, Oh, all all the character people in the, all, the, particularly the men, all the character men, the best character men that were were there, and they were being tough guys and all sorts of, you know. And it, it was just, it was a wonderful cast, and I felt a bit um, uneasy at first because here were these people. I mean, I'd had a lot of experience, but they were all tough New Yorkers now, and and um, I think they were. I mean, I forget who I replaced, but maybe they all loved her, and um, maybe uh, they resented me. You know, you know that feeling that you can get. We asked Miss Matthews about audience reaction to The Shadow. I got a lot of reaction. I got a lot of mail, but I also got some frightening reaction. That these um, court was going. He was away over most most all weekends. He went up to Canada to. to do the um, Imperial Oil hockey broadcast, on, and he'd leave on Friday night and come back Monday morning. And of course, the shadow was on Sunday, so you know I was there alone. And I get these kids who would phone up, and really, at first it was kind of fun. They'd say, "Oh, Marco, we'll meet you in the cemetery," or something like this. But then finally, it got a bit scary. 
And then they would come around to our apartment and lift signs all over with kind of nasty words and stuff. It was just, uh, it got um, too much, you know. But mostly, the, the mail was marvelous. It was, it was a great response. I don't know, I mean, you certainly a daytime soap, you got a lot of mail soap. But I think it was equally as, as big. Miss Matthews recalls, with good humor, an amusing domestic difficulty she had with her husband, actor Court Benson. Court is a great baseball fan. And there was always a, a game on on Sunday afternoon. And um, so I'd come home and I'd say, uh, did you hear the shadow? Did you hear the show today? Um, oh, yeah, yes, yes, Grace. I, yeah, I heard it. And this went on. I thought, well, my goodness, I, this is great lack of enthusiasm. You know, I finally said, did you really? He said, well, off and on, you know, I was listening to the baseball, and then I'd switch a little bit to the shadow and so forth. So there was one non-fan, wasn't it? <laughs> During much of the Morrison Matthews collaboration, the shadow was announced by Andre Baruch. My own recollections of the shadow are rather vague because of my failing memory and having announced a zillion programs in radio and TV throughout the intervening years. Plus, the confusion in my mind as to who played what when. I remember I followed Ken Roberts as the announcer on The Shadow. I do not remember how I was picked, probably by the agency, Ruth Roth and Ryan. I know that Brett Morrison played the lead, of course. Unfortunately, this fine actor is no longer with us. On your marks, everyone, get ready to play quick as a flash. From 1944 to 1951, another radio incarnation of The Shadow was as a guest detective on the popular Quick as a Flash quiz program. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Bill Cullen bringing you radio's most exciting quiz game, Quick as a Flash. And for an extra special treat as guest detective in the mystery contest today, and all this week, as a matter of fact, you're going to meet one of your favorite radio detectives, Lamont Cranston, The Shadow. And hey, at the end of our show, we have our pyramid contest, which today is worth $565. And now, everybody, get ready to act quick as a flash, because here we go. Well, here we are with that quick as a flash mystery problem we told you about. And in this contest, we give our contestants the opportunity to play detective by presenting a puzzle in crime. To set the stage for us all this week, we've invited... Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> yes, it's Brett Morrison, known to all of you as Lamont Cranston, alias The Shadow. Hey, now... Now, the contestant who first spots the clue which solves the mystery will be ordered $20. And now it's my great pleasure to present Lamont Cranston, the shadow in Death Pays the Call. Again, announcer Andre Baruch. The only incident that sticks in my mind about doing the shadow was the fact that I almost missed one of the programs. I was involved in the finals of a golf tournament in Westchester, New York, which is about 40 minutes away from the WOR studios in Manhattan. I won the match on the 18th hole and suddenly realized that I had just 40 minutes to get to the studio. Without changing clothes or shoes, I jumped into the cars, sped down the West Side Highway, cutting in and out of lanes in a desperate effort to get there on time. Traffic on this particular Sunday was inordinately heavy, and as time ticked away, it looked as if my unblemished record of having never missed a program was about to be broken. I arrived in the lobby of the studio 30 seconds before airtime, grabbed an elevator, got off at the 20th floor, rushed in with five seconds left, pulled the script from the hands of the producer who was about to take my place, and breathlessly announced... Once again, your neighborhood blue coal dealer brings you the thrilling adventures of The Shadow, etc., etc. 